Um, so for the next uh, for the next little bit, we're going to talk about real numbers. Um, so real numbers. What are what are real numbers? How do we do arithmetic with them? And then I'm going to talk very briefly about decimals and percents, uh, and then also fractions. Just put fractions with that. Okay. Um, so this is the so this is the part of numbers and arithmetic that we're sort of used to and should and should be relatively straightforward. Um, then after that, we're going to do some topics from number theory. So this is sort of a more sophisticated discussion and analysis of numbers and what numbers are and how they interact. So we're going to talk about things like factorization. Um, so you may, may remember things like a GCF greatest common factor, LCM least common multiple. Talk about things like that. We'll talk about modular arithmetic, which is also known as clock arithmetic. If you don't know what that is right now, that's fine, because you will. Uh, and we'll also talk about the Fibonacci sequence. So remember, we actually already briefly mentioned the Fibonacci sequence uh, in the previous section when we talked about sequences. So we're going to come back and look at that a little bit more. So we're, we're going to do these sort of, again, more sophisticated sorts of uh, topics involving numbers. But first, real numbers, what are they? Well, we're not ready to talk about what real numbers are. So first, whole numbers. Whole numbers are the things we deal with uh, very much every day, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Everyone knows how to work pretty well with whole numbers. Next, suppose you owe somebody some money. What, what, oh, what numbers do we need for that? We need negative numbers. So we take whole numbers, then also add their negatives, you get integers. Next, um, suppose yes. <laughs> What's uh, some? Occasionally, there might be a number between two and three. So right. So fractions, which are almost equivalent to decimals, but not quite. And I'll say that in a second. So a fraction is anything that you can represent as an integer divided by an integer. These are also called rational numbers. Now, there are, there are different ways to think of fractions. Um, and this is a little confusing because we always use fraction notation, but there are different ways to think of it. So one way is a part of something. And this is actually what people, when people usually say a fraction in, in when they're speaking in English, like, oh, I only got a fraction of the pie. This is usually what they mean. People u when people usually say a fraction, they usually mean, oh, I got a part of something, like a part of the whole. That's not the only way that a fraction can be interpreted. Um, as you uh, as you said, it could also be written as a de something. You could also write it as a decimal. Um, so a fraction you can also think of it as division. So, for example, eight divided by four. How would you write that as a fraction? Eight over four. So without actually simplifying it, we can just think of it as saying, oh, this fraction means we should divide. Um, and then, of course, there's just a simple notation of what's a fraction. It's a number over a number. Um, so, and a bit, a bit of an extension for a second. Eh. Okay. So suppose you have the problem 2 times 4 over 7. What's the first thing that we're all taught to do in order to actually do this problem out? Right. So everyone was taught this right. You write 2 over 1 instead. And then that lets you go ahead and do the multiplication. Okay. Or it makes it easier to see it. Okay. So notice that 2 is a whole number, but you can think of it as a fraction. And sometimes we do that in order to help us do uh, this arithmetic. Kay. So the idea, of, the idea of fractions is actually somewhat uh, sophisticated. 
um, in that there are many different ways that you can think of fractions. Sometimes something like the number two could be thought of a fraction or you could think of it as a whole number. Okay. So already we're getting uh, into slightly dicey territory once we start talking about fractions. We haven't talked about real numbers yet. Next, let's write numbers in order. All numbers. All the numbers that, that uh, we're used to anyway. So, the way that we typically represent numbers in order, using a number line. So how do you write a number line? Draw the line with little arrows, and then we just mark off all these different numbers. So I have put in, we're not ready for that one yet, okay. So I have put in a bunch of numbers here. So when you make a number line, the easiest thing to mark off are the integers. So you notice that the integers are marked off, all right. We've started to talk about fractions. So let's talk, so we have some fractions marked off. In fact, let's go, let's go mark these off from scratch. So, where, where does the fraction one half go? The fraction one half. Right. Right. Not just between zero and one, but right smack in the middle. And what about three quarters? Right. Got half and one right halfway between there. Now, what about the fraction? One sixth. Where does that go? Right. So this is something that's always important to remember. One sixth versus one half. Six is bigger than two, but what's bigger? One sixth or one half? One half. Okay. So it sounds easy when I say it like that. Uh, but as you should recall, sometimes comparing fractions for which is bigger can be tricky. Uh, so what about the fraction 16 over 7? Where does that go? Yeah, you got to think about it. <laughs> 16 over 7, check it. Yeah. So, but notice that it already, re already requires some thought, right? It's not immediately obvious. So you say 17 goes in, a 7 goes into 16 twice plus a little bit, so it's a little bigger than 2. Now, what would be a uh, what would make it a lot easier to put these numbers in order? If I wrote them as decimals, right? Because, for example, 16 over 7, this is approximately 2.28. So if I told you, hey, where does the number 2.28 go? Is that obvious? That's obvious. One half, 0.5, three quarters is 0.75. One sixth is approximately, these are all approximations. Point one six seven. So, look, sometimes it's useful to use fractions. So, for example, if I said you have a group of three people and one of them is male, how would you express that? Relative to the group, one-third of the group is male. That's easy. Sometimes it's not useful. So when you're trying to put numbers in order, some fractions are easy. One-half, three-quarters, those are easy. But it's... What if I said, uh, you know, 97 over 12? Well, that will require some work. So fra some, sometimes, if we're trying to put things in order, for example, fractions aren't the most useful thing. In that case, decimals might work better. Okay. Now, there's one more type of real number. These are irrational numbers. So what the heck is an irrational number? 
cannot exactly it cannot it's an it's a real number that can't be expressed as a fraction so the way that you typically so the definition is you can't write it as a fraction but the way that we usually think about this is if you try to write it as a decimal it keeps on going without stopping and without repeating So, for example, if I write the number negative 4, well, not only is that rational, that's easy, that's an integer. Um, so, what if you write 1 third? Well, 1 third as a decimal is 0.3333333. Keeps going. So, that's rational. What about the number 4.8373686726565 dot dot dot? Based on what I've written here, you have to say it's irrational. Because what I've indicated to you is that I, when, when written as a decimal, this number goes on forever and there's no repeating. So this represents an irrational number. So what are real numbers? The real numbers are the rational numbers and irrational numbers taken together. <coughs> so it turns out these, these, aren't the, these aren't the only numbers um, that we talk about. Um, you guys may have seen complex numbers or imaginary numbers mm -hmm. using I. Some of you may have seen it, some of you may have not. Mm -hmm. So, but for, that's one example of the reason we can't just say all numbers what we're really talking about are real numbers because there are other numbers aside from just real numbers okay so but you take the rational numbers take the irrational numbers put them together and what do you got <coughs> real numbers okay so and let me just put in a comment right now irrational numbers are kind of hard to get a handle on because we don't really work with them in that many contexts we certainly don't work with irrational numbers in everyday life. You know, you never say, oh, I got square root of 2 worth of change today. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so there are some irrational numbers that we, square root of 2 is probably the irrational number that everyone's seen. So we know square root of 2 is irrational. Um, you may remember that the number pi, 3.14159, blah, 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 you may have been told at some point that's an irrational number. So for the most part, what do we have? We have just a couple of examples of irrational numbers that we learned about in class. But aside from that, you don't really encounter irrational numbers that much. Certainly not in day-to-day -day life. Um, so this makes, it, this makes them slightly hard to get a handle on. So the best thing I can give you is just this last example, which is when you have something written down as a decimal number that goes on forever, but it doesn't repeat, that's an irrational number. Okay. Oh, so, so any questions on these parts? So that's good? Okay. Yeah. Isn't there a fraction like the Yeah. 22 over 7 is not equivalent like right? to pi. 22 over 7 is an approximation for pi that is often used, but it is not equal to pi. Period. I don't blame you, I blame the educational system. <laughs> Part of the, just a quick comment, um, well, yeah. <laughs>
Okay, so that's a little bit about the structure of real numbers. Whole numbers, integers, uh, fractions, which is the same as rational numbers, and irrational numbers. So next, I want to talk a bit about signs and absolute value. So on its face, this is a relatively easy topic. However, there are a couple of common mistakes that are made. just want to clean that up before we go forward. So the first thing you need to know is that negative negative 4 <laughs> is 4. Okay. Um, now, I know you've seen this before. And in fact, we actually used this idea earlier in the class in logic. In logic, what is this? What is this? What is the similar statement from logic? Exactly. Not only in only in logic, we don't have four. So not not p is the same as p. Okay. So that so that's the same. I using the same idea. That's what you say in logic. In arithmetic, we know that negative negative four is the same as four. Okay. So that's an idea that we know. Absolute value. Absolute value just means make it positive. So what is the absolute value of 5? It's just 5. Okay. I'm sorry, I should say absolute value on real numbers means make it positive. Absolute value has different meanings in other contexts. Okay. Absolute value of negative 8 is 8. So, actually, I do want to interject. So, the full definition is distance from zero. That's, that's what absolute value really means. Okay. But for our purposes, just to say make it positive is roughly equivalent. Okay. Um, what we're going to do right now is, uh, you, I'm sure you've seen this before, I don't know if you use it or not, but the actual definition of absolute value as a function. So, if you get the, what's the absolute value of a positive number? It's just the number itself. So that's how we say... this part. So the absolute value of x is just x as long as x is positive or zero. Now, what do you do if x is negative? If x if x is a negative number, what does absolute value tell you to do? Change it to positive. So the question is, how do we write take a negative number and make it positive, how do we write that in algebra? Exactly. So the thing you have to understand in making this definition is that in the second line, what do we know about x? We're saying that x is less than zero. So x is negative. So in the second part of this definition, x is negative. So when you take negative of that, what kind of number will you get? What is negative of x, x being a negative number? So what is negative of a negative number? It's positive. So even though we're writing negative x, you're like, negative x, that's a negative number. No, it's not. Because what do we know about x here? x is already negative. So we take the negative of that, it's positive. So that's why this algebraic definition is. I'm, I know I'm, I know you've all seen it before, but you might not remember it, or you may not have understood it. But that's the trick in understanding it. Okay. So anyway, um, let's get back to the arithmetic part of doing absolute value. Um, what if you have the absolute value of 7 minus 9? What do you do? We get 7 minus 9 is negative 2. And now what do you do? Absolute value 
the answer is positive 2. So notice that you first solve what's inside. You do not say that the uh, yeah, absolute value of 7 minus 9 is the same as 7 plus 9. Absolute value does not turn negatives into pluses. It turns negative numbers into positive numbers. Very different. You dig? Okay. So this is a somewhat common mistake. Okay. And now that I've brought your attention to it, I know you won't... If I gave you an example, I know you'd get it right. But the trick is, you know, get it right on the homework and get it right when you're not thinking about what the professor just said five seconds ago. Okay. So that was a short bit on absolute value. Any questions on those things? Okay. So, Stephanie, any questions? No? Okay. Next. Operations on integers. I hope, as the stuff that we just did, I hope this is also review. 7 plus 9, 16. 7 plus 9, Oh, and 9 plus 7 is also 16. Right. 8 minus 3 is 5. But what is 3 minus 8? Negative 5. Okay. So when you're dealing with subtract, when you're dealing with addition, you can switch the order, the commutative property. When you're dealing with subtraction, you can't. You know this already. Okay. However, there is a way in which we can switch the order. You have to think of it as subtraction, or excuse me, you have to think of it as addition, but on the integers. So, 8 minus, excuse me, yeah, 8 minus 3 is, would be the same as negative 3 plus 8. So the trick, so one way to think about this is when you have 8 minus 3, think of the minus as going with the 3. So as long as the 3 owns the minus, then you're allowed to move it around. So if you start with 8 minus 3 equals 5, you can change that to 8 plus negative 3 equals 5. And now you have an addition problem. And now you can move the numbers around any way you like. Does that make sense? Okay. So I presume that everyone knows this on some level. I don't know if you've ever seen it explicitly discussed before. Um, probably you have. Um, but this is very useful because a lot of the time we do want we do have a subtraction problem where we want to move the numbers around. But if you want to move the numbers around in a subtraction problem, you first have to think of them as addition on integers. And then once you rewrite it in terms of addition, then you can move stuff around. Okay. Five minus four. That's one. I'm going to not change any numbers or any operate. I'm not going to change any numbers, and I'm not going to change that negative sign in any way. But I'm going to completely change the meaning of this expression. What did I do? What did I write? I added parentheses. So notice that parentheses can completely change the meaning of something that you've written down. And here the parentheses mean, as somebody said, uh, that you have to multiply. Now, do parentheses always mean that you have to multiply? Nope. Here I've simply rewritten the 5 minus 4, I've rewritten it as a addition problem on integers. And not always, but sometimes we like to write parentheses around integers. Um, 
I don't, but I know text, some textbooks do. 5 plus in parentheses is negative 4. So here, are we multiplying? No. The operation is addition. So again, this can be kind of tricky because we've got this one thing that we write down, which are parentheses, but it can mean different things at different times. So you've always got to be aware of that. Parentheses might mean multiplication. Parentheses also might mean do it first, or if you like, order of operations. So, if you see parentheses 3, parentheses 5, this means multiplication. If you see 3 minus open parentheses 2 plus 5 close parentheses, that says do me first. But possibly the parentheses could mean both. 7 open parentheses 6 minus 2 close parentheses. The parentheses the parentheses are first telling you do me they're saying do me first on what? Relative to they're saying do what first? The 6 minus 2 in this problem. But then what else are they telling you to do? Multiply so 6 minus 2 gives you 4. Parentheses are also telling you multiply the 7 times the 4 that you get. So, presumably you're mostly comfortable with this by this point, but again, this is a place where sometimes people make mistakes or careless mistakes. Um, and then finally, uh, as I mentioned before, some parentheses sometimes mean neither. There's no uh, 5 plus in parentheses negative 4. There's no do me first and there's no multiplication here. There's just parentheses because. Uh, and because we're only talking about arithmetic, I haven't even started talking about when we use parentheses regarding functions. Because that is, that can be uh, relatively confusing and complicated as well. But we're going to not talk about that uh, for the purposes of this class. But So in arithmetic, parentheses could refer to either multiplication or of operations or both or neither. So I want to go back and talk uh, go back and talk about signs combined with addition and subtraction. <coughs> well, first combine with addition and subtraction. So nine plus seven, like we said, sixteen. That's easy. Eight minus three is five. Three minus eight, negative five. Now, what is negative eight minus eleven? Negative 8 minus 11. Okay, and how did you get that? When you have two negatives, you add So that's the typical technique that we all know. My negative 8 minus 11 equals negative 19. You say, well, I've got <coughs> so the way I like to the way I like to explain this is that minus eight minus eleven means you lose some and then you lose some more. So the size of the number gets bigger, right? You're sort of, if you like, you're accumulating losses. So how much have I lost? I've lost lost eight. I've lost eleven. So you add eight and eleven together, so you've lost nineteen altogether. But it's a it it's a, a completely it's a loss, so it's a negative inference. <coughs> and to a large extent, we haven't even thought about this in a while because you guys have probably been using calculators for a while. But I want to remind you these things. Kay. And what about negative twelve plus thirty four? Yeah. So. You've got a gain of 34, a loss of 12. So the easiest way to think of this is 34 minus 12. <coughs> um, 
which gives you 22, and you know the result is going to be positive because you've gained more than you've lost. So this rule of thumb, which I'm, we learned this in elementary school, is when you're doing addition and subtraction, you keep the sign of the bigger number. But then this immediately became confusing because for multiplication and division, there's a different rule for how do you deal with signs. What is the rule for dealing with signs in multiplication and division? Wait, a negative times a negative is a... Okay. <laughs> you went so fast. I had to check. Okay, right. So, for example, 3 times 2 just gives you 6. And how do we do this? Uh, actually, 3 times 2 is that's easy. Negative 12 times 8 is negative 96. So I'll tell you the way that I do this in my head. I say, what is 8 times 12? 8 times 12 is 96. Now, what should the sign of the answer be? The sign should be negative. No. Yeah. Multiplication. Yeah. Right. Seven times negative, okay, so Shaquille, seven times negative four. You do seven times four, which gives you 28. Mm -hmm. And then should the answer be positive or negative? Mm -hmm. the answer should be negative. Because you've got a positive times a negative. That's a negative number. So again, there is, and I, I, I think it's a little bit beyond, it's not, it's not quite uh, the role of this class to sort of teach you, to remind you where these rules come from, uh, but I'm reminding you of the shortcuts. Um, yeah. And then finally, negative 5 times negative 6. Well, I just do 5, I do 5 times 6 is 30, and then what should the sign of the answer be? Positive because you've got a negative times a negative. And in multiplication, negative negative gives you positive. Notice that it's completely different when you're dealing with addition and subtraction. With addition and subtraction, if you have negative negative, what is your answer? Your ans in addition and subtraction, if you have a negative number and then a negative number, your answer will be negative. You dig? Just like the, lo the previous example, minus 8 minus 11. So always keep in mind what is the operation. Um, and then for division, of course, uh, as we mentioned before, we can represent division just by writing a fraction. So when you write a fraction, when you simplify it, you're really just using the rules of division. So negative 24 over 3. So how do we figure the answer? Well, 24 over 3 is 8. And then what should the sign be? sign should be negative. You've got negative positive and for multiplication and division that gives you a negative number. <coughs> so what about this? 2 times negative 4 times 5 times negative 3 times negative 5. Alright. So I'll give, you, I'll give you one cheat. I'll let you know that 2 times 4 times 5 times 3 times 5 is 600. Okay. But now, how do we figure out what the sign of the answer should be? Oh, right. So there are three negatives, so what does that tell you? Because negative, negative, negative. What happens when you have two negatives? There's a positive. Exactly. So anytime you have two negatives, four negatives, six negatives, and again, this is, this is for multiplication and division, when you have two negatives, four negatives, six negatives, what's going to happen? They're going to pairwise, if you like, cancel off and become positives. But how many negatives do we have here? Three. So there's going to be one extra negative dangling. So your answer is negative. So that's the shortcut. Instead of saying a negative times a negative is a positive, then you got a negative times a negative positive. No, no, no. The big rule is just an even number of negatives when you're multiplying will all pair up and cancel to become positives. 
So another way to think of this is that you, the, the sign switches every time. So one negative is negative, two negatives is positive, three negatives is negative, four negatives is positive. So an even number will an even number of them will give you a positive number. It's like crossing off the negatives in pairs. Okay. So one of the one of the reasons to review these rules in such detail is the tricky part often comes in when you're doing algebra. Because when you're doing algebra, you're dealing with x's and it becomes a little more abstract and harder to remember precisely what the rules are. Right? So for example, when I said uh, minus 8 minus 11, you could actually mentally hop along a number line. You can't do that <coughs> uh, directly when you have an algebra problem. Suppose we got 4 minus, in parentheses, 5 minus x, and I said simplify this. <coughs> what is the first thing that you do? Okay, right. So parentheses say, <coughs> do me first. Is there something in the parentheses to do or to simplify? No. So what next? Sorry? Distribute what? Distribute the 4? You can. Is the operation between 4 and what's in the parentheses, is that operation multiplication? No. Okay. So, yeah, Paul. It, sorry? Find the greatest common factor. Okay. So, what is it? Sorry? Yeah. yeah, this is simply awful because we've got so many different techniques that we've learned that we don't know which one to use. What we'd like to do is combine the stuff that we can combine. Now at the moment, what is it? Well, we looked inside the parentheses, and there's nothing in there that we can combine. But what, what will we be combining? What, what do we hope to be combining at some point? Uh, uh-huh. And then it's going to be minus 1 times 5 minus plus minus 1 times negative x. Right. <coughs> okay. So you, ac you actually hopped ahead to the more sort of sophisticated explanation. Um, what I was going to say is that eventually we'll want to combine the 4 and the 5. But right now the parentheses are in the way. So how do we get rid of the parentheses? You can't just erase them because you've got that minus in front. So typically what we've been taught to do is distribute the negative. So it winds up, oops, oh, okay. So when you distribute the negative, what you wind up writing is 4, you get a minus 5, and then what happens to the x? It's a plus x. And then from there, of course, we can simplify. But uh, what I wanted to point out to you is that when we distribute a negative, what are we really doing? Well, it's actually it's what Terrell just said. What you're really doing is rewriting that negative sign in this way. So multiplying by, or having a negative of something is the same as multiplying by negative 1. So we've really got <coughs> 
is 4 plus a negative this thing and that negative is really like a negative 1. So distributing that negative sign, what we're really doing, although shortcutting it, is taking that negative and rewriting it as a negative 1 and that we can now distribute. So we've now got 4 plus a negative 5 and then plus negative negative x which as we know is just plus x. And then, oops. And then that's just minus 1 plus x. So when I tell you the basic rules of parentheses and signs and all that, it all sounds very straightforward. But then when you try to, when you start getting to do problems, it's very easy to make careless mistakes. It's very easy, for example, just to rewrite this as 4 minus 5 minus x because you've made a careless mistake. What was the careless mistake? Not distributing, not realizing that the minus in front of the parentheses not only applies to the 5, but also applies to the minus x as well. Okay. So that's that for that.